Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I've got something slightly different. A documentary has just been released called Good Night Oppie. It is a big budget feature length telling of the stories of the twin Mars exploration rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. And the producers asked me if I wanted to spend some time talking with some of the scientists or engineers behind it. And the truth is I've talked to many of the scientists and engineers behind it. But as somebody that makes lots of videos telling stories about science, I was really almost more interested to talk to the director who has taken all this huge amount of archival footage, blended it with interviews and cinematic special effects to tell this story in a, a way that is suitable for the big screen. So yeah, this is me sitting down with Ryan White. Okay, so I'm Scott Manley. Hi, and I guess I'm with Ryan? Yes, that's right. Hey, Scott. Hi. Uh, well, so first of all, and first and foremost, I'm so glad you have told this story. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to say, as a, like, I, I'm, I come from the science side, and I find, I looked at your, you know, your history and your background and the work, and you've definitely had a sort of fascinating cross-section of documentary work in the past. And so how did you end up deciding to tell this story about rovers on Mars? Yeah, you look at my filmography and it seems very diverse in the subject matters. Uh, the one through line being that they're all character-based films and most of those films you're looking at are about women. So it was very convenient that these robots were gendered um, as female when I was initially uh, pitched the project. But I had always wanted to make a space film because as a child, I loved space films. I loved missions. Um, I loved following NASA's missions. Um, and I wanted to be an astronaut. I thought that's what I would do with my life. I went to a nerdy math and science school. Um, but eventually I found the arts in filmmaking and it's what I ended up doing with my life. And I don't regret it, but I always was hoping that I would find a story that would take me to space in some sort of way. And um, this idea was brought to me by Film 45 and Amblin, and that's uh, Pete Berg's company and Steven Spielberg's company. And they had an idea to make an a documentary about spirit and opportunity. And I loved the idea from the moment I heard it because it was character-based and because they had access to NASA's archive, which could make the audience feel like they're in the moment, um, instead of like this event already happened, we had the footage in the moment to keep it like an unfolding journey. Um, and so I thought it was finally the perfect space story that fell into my lap. Yeah, I mean, I think I've seen some big screen documentaries, uh, space documentaries in the past decade or so, but they're all about human space flight. And this is the first one I can think of that's about robotic exploration. And that's you, that's really down to having the rovers as characters. Um, so you think that that was critical for the audiences to be able to, to be sold this story, to be interested? It's interesting because it is, it is a film about robots for sure, uh, but at its heart, it's a film about humans because the robots don't exist without the humans and definitely the robots aren't characters or have personalities without the humans projecting that upon them. Otherwise, they're just a box of wires. So while it's not about, you know, astronauts, it is about human endeavor into space. It's just human beings can't safely go to Mars yet. And so these geniuses have figured out a way um, in lieu of that to be able to send these robotic creatures to Mars to act as our avatar and explore this world that we've never seen before. Uh, and so it's kind of twofold. I think the, the, the rovers are definitely characters, but they're only characters because of the human beings that are behind them. And so when you're producing the film, uh, again, you're trying to make, make it appeal to audiences. You have a lot of uh, CGI of opportunity and spirit. And I, I guess you worked with the effects teams to try to balance between you know, being an emotionless robot and going you know, full on Wally. -E. You know, how, how did you sort of approach trying to strike that balance? Well, it was a real combination of visual effects and sound design and making sure that they were both rooted in reality and that we were never anthropomorphizing the robot any more than the human beings who were working on the robots were 
willing to in the types of anecdotes that they told us. Uh, so for instance, you know, Mark Mangini, who's our sound designer, and he's done some of the most epic sci-fi films in history. He did Dune last year. He did Mad Max Fury Road, which he also won an Oscar for. But he really took the sound design in this film from a documentary point of view. Like he actually went out and recorded the robots that exist on Earth that are the replicas of spirit and opportunity. We went out to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and, and mic'd up those robots and were able to record all of the real sounds that they make. And so, you know, the wheels going through sand or what it's like for the head to turn or for it to go to sleep at night when it nods its head. He was able to capture all of those, uh, all those inherent sounds and to layer them in the film. Likewise, um, Perseverance, the most current rover, landed while we were making the film, and she was sending down sound recordings for the first time. So when you watch the beginning of my film, Over Black, it says Amazon Studio Presents, and you hear the wind come in of Mars. That's the first recording that ever came down from Mars, and Mark was able to layer that in throughout the film. And the visuals were the same thing. We were always giving all of the photography and all of the data to industrial light and magic and saying, use this real information, this real photography, but make it move, bring it alive. And the task was always to try to do that in a photo real way that was as authentic as possible. I, I really wanted to, I'm going to say, I really wanted to talk to the director because I also make films, right? I make these, I make like three movies a week, 10 minute documentaries on science. And you've made this magnificent, you know, hour and a half long thing. How long did that take? Your whole process going back, when did this start? How did you, you know, how much time did it take to create something this slick? It took just under two years from when the idea was first hatched to make a documentary to when we actually locked and delivered to Amazon, meaning all of the post-production was done. And that is a relatively fast schedule for a documentary, at least the type of documentaries that I make, because I'm a verite filmmaker, meaning I'm usually following something as it's unfolding. And that often means you are totally at the mercy of whatever is unfolding. Like if the story's not ready to be done, with itself, then you can't finish your film. So some of my films have taken upwards of five or six years to complete because I didn't have an ending and I had to wait for the ending. This one was a little easier in that sense. It wasn't an easy film by any means, but when it comes to being contained because the story had already happened, so I just needed to assemble all the puzzle pieces. And, and the two big keys to that were the archival footage from NASA and then the visual effects from industrial light and magic. And that took two years. Well, and so, yeah, I mean, you have a lot of archival footage. Um, like, how did you even dig through that? And what steps had you to prepare to make that work on the big screen? Because not all this is good for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I had never made, um, oh, I had made, a, like, parts of my films have been archival, but I had never made a truly archival film before. And... This was almost a thousand hours from NASA that they were handing over to us in boxes or on hard drives, but they didn't even know exactly what was on this footage. They would say, you're welcome to watch it all. We don't know what's on it. Might not even be the right mission for some of it, but have at it. And so we assembled a very big team in the summer of 2020. It was the first step was starting to, starting to watch down every tape minute by minute. And it really was like looking for needles in a haystack because a lot of the footage was very boring. You know, someone sitting at a computer for many hours where nothing happens. And then it was really rewarding when you would find that needle in a haystack and it would be some magnificent scene of say like ABBA's SOS playing in mission control when a robot has gone missing. And it was all the way down to college interns watching this footage down and making sure that we didn't miss those little nuggets. Obviously, a lot of the story is told through the scientists. Did they tell you, you must have this image, this piece of footage, you know, you've got to find it? I mean, did they cue you in? Well, we would ask them, we would ask them out of curiosity, because if we heard of a, of a story of something spectacular happening in one of the robots' lives, we would often say, like, 
Do you remember being filmed during that? Was there a camera there? Because there was no, there was no method to go find, you know, a day um, during the mission and be able to like look it up in a log and then pull that tape. So the first step was often saying like, do you remember their cameras being there? And sometimes they would say like, oh, absolutely. I remember being filmed. I remember being interviewed about it. And so then we would go on this chase to find that. Most of the time they were saying like, we don't remember. We think there were cameras. Um, so a lot of it was just about trying to find, you know, some spectacular story that we were told to, told, uh, told by an engineer or scientist to uh, go on a search for footage that could help tell that story. And there were a lot of great stories we were told where we never found footage, and so they didn't end up in the film. So, and it was also the actual scientific uh, imagery from the mission itself. And I presume you guys figured out how to go into the analyst notebooks and pull that down. And Yeah, you're very familiar. You know the, you know the term, which no one knows. Yeah. We, I mean, uh, Doug Ellison, who's one of the, the camera engineers, he really held our hand through a lot of this and made our lives a lot easier by saying like, listen, kids, this is where you can find this and this is where you can find that. And the analyst notebook, you know, that's what Angela Bassett is reading in our film. I didn't write the, any of those words. Those are pulled from the analyst notebook, and they're really beautiful, heartfelt, first person, keep you, you know, steeped in the drama and suspense of whatever's going on in the robot's life, and were really um, a boon for us when it came to storytelling. Is there stuff that you have now, since sort of in this process, learned something which changed your conception of what you thought was true about the science? You know, is there something that blew your mind? I didn't realize that, or... I, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to sound like a Luddite, but I don't even think I understood how much of our sister planet Mars is. It always sounded very Martian-y to me growing up, you know? And I think sci-fi films portray it as very alien, and perhaps it's the most fascinating planet when it comes to sci-fi or folklore or sci-fi writing. Um, and I didn't think I realized, like, how remarkably similar it is to Earth. Um, you know, obviously it has its drastic differences, but when it comes to when it comes to landscape and atmosphere that may have at once existed on Mars, I didn't think I understood um, how similar it was. And I think that, to me, is a huge takeaway from this film, and hopefully audiences will understand. It's for sure an emotional journey, this film, but it's also a scientific journey about the building blocks of telling us a story about what happened to our sister planet. And as you know, curiosity and perseverance are continuing to tell that story right now. And hopefully in our lifetimes, we can see humans step foot on Mars and continue to help us tell that story. But in some ways, I think it can be a cautionary tale about a planet that we know was much, was much more habitable at some point, and now we know is a horrible place for human beings to ever try to live. And our beautiful, precious, precarious planet that we live on now, is there uh, lessons to be learned um, from the history of Mars? What a bit of science from the Mars Exploration Rover program like really stood out. Which Is there anything other than the water or... Well, I couldn't have I couldn't have written it better. I mean, obviously the film focuses on on the story of water. We actually ended up losing a scene at the end, which really devastated me. But you often lose some of your favorite scenes nearing the final edit because you can't have a two and a half hour long film. And one was of Spirit's big discovery, and I'm sure I'm sure you know about it. But you know, Spirit was driving backwards, and she was dragging her wheel and everyone thought that was going to be a huge inhibitor for the rest of her mission. And the dragging of the wheel ended up uh, creating this trench behind her. And in that trench, they were able in the photos to see this white colored substance that they ended up measuring and testing, which ended up being silica. Uh, it was a huge discovery, again, on, a on the completely other side of the planet from opportunity showing the presence of water at one point, I guess. There was a real story of water that built throughout the mission, and I couldn't have written it in a better way where opportunity lands and immediately finds the presence of past water. But as you mentioned, that water was acidic. So 
it's a it's a first step in telling that story, but it's not the big story. And you couldn't write it better that it's not till her final year of living in an, in an Endeavor Crater that she discovers neutral pH, possibly drinkable water. Uh, and so that to me was kind of like the perfect sort of evolution of a three act structure um, of discovery. How did you pick who you were going to interview and you know, how long did you spend with them to come down to the final product? The, well, we spent a long time with them on camera. I would say most of those interviews went around four hours on average, like three to five hours which was also an opportunity. I like to just, I always do really long interviews because I just like to let people talk and not be trying to direct them, especially at the beginning of an interview. I think it establishes a lot more comfort level if you're truly listening and you're not trying to change the subject all the time. So I always build a lot of time in for my interviews, but there's 11 people in the documentary that are interviewed. You know, there's hundreds of people on camera in our movie. But we could only interview 11 and everyone that we interviewed is in the film. There's no one that we cut out. So we were we were trying to be very careful that we knew this was an emotional sort of cathartic experience for these people to sit down and to do these interviews. So we didn't want to put people in the position where we put them through this process and that we didn't include them in the film because you always have to make those tough decisions in editing a documentary. So we very carefully picked those 11 people by doing pre-interviews and they were all picked for various reasons and this team as you know is thousands of people and we could have picked 11 other people and told a beautiful film and we could have picked 11 other people and told a beautiful film there's no real like rhyme or reason or methodology onto why these 11 ended up in the film except that we wanted like a wide breadth of backgrounds in all different ways, ages, what role they played on the robot, geographically, gender, obviously. And we wanted great storytellers that would bring something new. And we also wanted young audiences, if they're coming to see the film, which I hope they will, kids or teenagers, to see themselves represented in the faces of the people that we included. I guess what I've got to ask now, as a director, you're, you've you're going to be looking at future projects. Do you see that perhaps one day there's there's more science in your future? Do you have any ideas of science or stories that you you think are are worth telling? May, yeah, I mean for sure. I'm I'm a math and science nerd. I like I went to a math and science school. I love that stuff. But I also really want to spend my career making character-based films and you know, this film is about robots that are characters but they are characters and definitely the humans behind them are characters so i'd have to find a story that's like that i'm sure you have many ideas and i'm happy to hear them at some point and like of course i would love to if if i live long enough to go on some sort of uh mission whether that's to the moon or somewhere else that could be documented and i think we're getting closer and closer to that possibility with, with, with space travel being opened much more commercially. Um, but I would have to find something that I believe is, has, has a beginning and a middle and, a, and an end that I'll, I'll at least live to see. So I'm not dying with an unfinished film. Um, mm -hmm. So it's about finding that right story that's next, but absolutely. I would love to do it again. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, thanks for making this film and uh, look forward to uh, watching it again in theaters. Oh, thank you. Yeah, go see it in a the theater. Have fly safe.